No matter what story you're trying to tell, it really matters where you start telling the story. Because where you start telling a story is where it ends. It's kind of the whole point of you opening your mouth, right, and telling what you had to say about that topic. Think of it. If, if you were even to tell something as simple as the children's story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and you were to start that story from the moment that this fair-haired girl enters the unoccupied house, it would have a very different feel and focus to it than if you started telling the story from the very beginning where we get to meet and enjoy three lovely bears that we get to call mama and papa and baby and, and we get to see this, this lovely family life that they have and they, they've cooked a meal but oops, it's too hot Mama suggests that we go outside and enjoy a walk. And so they go and, and let the food cool down. Of course, while they're gone, this, this nosy, obnoxious girl invades their house, eats their food, breaks their stuff, sleeps in their bed. How very different if you start telling that story with the little girl Whereas the bears are the lovely family and the girl the, the villain of the story, the whole story is turned upside down when you start with her. And you start with her as the uh, real independent type, you know. She doesn't need anyone else coming in and rescuing her day. And she's the bold and courageous type that can go exploring the woods all by herself. You know, she's going to be okay, and, and she's so bold, if not obnoxious, just to walk into a house, and, and as she sees some food, she knows what she wants out of life. She takes a sip. Ew, too hot. She tries the next one. Ew, too cold. She tries the third one, of course, and oh, this one's just right, and eats it all up, and then from furniture to finally the audacity to get in every one of the beds and then fall asleep. Of course, her whole time out in the woods was uh, rudely interrupted by these monstrous bears that wake her up and she knows what to do. She's got some moxie. She just heads for the window. She bolts out and she's on her way home. She escaped with her life and she did it herself, you know. This girl's going to have a story to tell. She's going to have something to tell her children when, when you know, they, this is what your mom did. How very different the story of where you start because that's where you end. Villains become the heroes and heroes become the villains. How much more then is it so important and key and critical of where you start the story? Because where you start is where you end. It's the point of talking and telling the story. If you start the story of your faith with, of all people, you. And it's all about, you know, what you're going to do in this life, you know. And I, I'm going to choose this church and I'm going to choose this style of worship and I'm going to read this parts of the Bible and maybe not this part and I'm going to listen to this speaker and I'm not going to listen to this one and so and so your life goes on because it's all about you. And then, you know, the whole story then of Jesus and his death and his resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins yeah, I believe that, and, and I'm going to heaven when I die. If we start with you, then, and just this very narrow, if you know nothing else, you at least know Jesus died for you, well then, you kind of miss three quarters of the Bible. You know, the whole Old Testament, and it's really not as relevant. In fact, some people have even asked the question, do we even need the Old Testament? Why, why, is it even, why is it even important for a Christian to even read this? And Okay, and, and then, uh, well, we become Goldilocks at this point, and the heroes and villains are flipped. But it's like, okay, okay, well, 
let's at least go into the Old Testament. Let's go all the way to Genesis 3. Let's start with that we sinned and we really blew it. And yeah, uh, and, and God is rightly angry about, that we've trespassed on his property and eaten his food. If we even start there, all the way back to the third chapter, why, then the whole story becomes about an angry God that someone needs to make happy. You know, we need to pacify him. We need, we need to be good. You know, look at all the stories of the Old Testament from that point on. You know, the world sinned, so God flooded it. He saved Noah because he's a good guy. And, and then you go on and on, and Israel sinned, and God sent this, and, and Pharaoh wouldn't let him go when he sent that. And God's just this constantly angry God who needs to be made happy with a blameless life. And then finally, Jesus comes along. Oh, Finally, he, he's going to the cross and he takes on the wrath and the punishment of God. And, and now, the, our job as a church is to get people to now believe this. You know, Jesus died and rose again. And that's how God's going to make, you can't face the judge without Jesus, you know. And you, you have to believe this story. And the whole point of the church is getting people to believe the story. All of these plot points are important. Each and every page is critical and key. But if you start in the wrong place, and the wrong place is any place but the very beginning, you end up with a very different story. See, the story starts with God. You know, first verse, in the beginning, God. And, and God, he, he creates everything. And he, he's this, this perfect, cozy family life of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and they're just enjoying this great love and, and truth and holiness and goodness. And then out of this family life flows everything that we see. And he, he makes everything so perfectly and good so that when he makes his man and woman and places them in this garden, there are these really good things to eat. And a cool breeze like today blows and, and the sun is shining and everything is good because God desires to have a family. See, that's how the story ends with God and his family in this perfect place. And everything in between that these two bookends between God and and God, everything that you, we call normal life, from get up, go to school, get up, go to work life, fits in between, between these two pages. But make no mistake, God is the one who's the main character. He's the hero. He's the one on the grand adventure. He's the one who's in true and honest peril of losing it all. And he does lose his true love, his beloved and in the pages then, he, we find him pursuing then and, and fighting hard to win his beloved from an enemy's clutches and bring his beloved home with himself to the wonderful family life that was once theirs. This story of God unfolds today with Abraham. And it starts off, I am God Almighty. And you, Abraham, and all of your descendants, I'm going to be your God. And I'm going to make a covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and the generations to come to be your God and to be the God of your descendants. This is an everlasting covenant. And while land and a place here on the earth was, was promised to Abraham and his descendants, even Abraham looked forward to something more than just here and now. But he looked forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder was God instead of longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. When God is the start of the story, it unfolds in a very different way for you and for me. It certainly did for Abraham and Sarah. See, for them, now it will be a life of faith and trust. It will be a life of being led 
and being provided for by this God. See, it wasn't a life about managing their sins. You know, oh, God's angry and we need to do something. Because Abraham and Sarah were far from perfect individuals. When you read the story, it's like, whoa, they did what? <laughs> okay. And, um, but God was their God. They were his people. And there was this mutual friendship and love and protection because that's the story God is writing. We get to be a part of this story too. We're written into its pages. No longer a covenant people through circumcision, but for, through baptism. We have a baptismal font here. And no matter the age of the person, from babies to elderly, we bring them here because here the story is written into their lives. Here we find that in Christ Jesus, all you are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's no longer now any Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. All are one in Christ Jesus. And here's the kicker. Every promise given to Abraham, it's given to you. The everlasting promises that I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. It's no longer about you trying to pacify an angry God. It's no longer about you trying to walk blamelessly on your own power, but now it's about a God who says, you're mine. And as I hear this story of God, I'm really confronted with the fact and the reality that I'm living more of a Goldilocks life than a his story life. And that most of my day, just my practical everyday get up, go to work day, I'm more concerned about what I'm going to do. What, what doors I'm going to open and what porridge I'm going to sip on and spit out if it's not exactly the way I want it. And I don't really care if I have to trespass. I don't really care if I have to walk over someone else's stuff. See, I'm really confronted with the fact that I'm writing my own story. And it is... It is a moment like right now where our God who began it all and continues it all and who will complete it all tenderly invites us to look into our own hearts and see if it is marked by a humility and faith to be led by him. And if not, to confess that. And, and Lord, I, I really am a Goldilocks story here and but I desire you. I desire to be led by you. I desire to know your story from page to page. See, the Old Testament doesn't need to be thrown out because it's his story. In the New Testament, every page, it's all our story now that we belong to God. And it's how we get to know who the author is. It's it's how he begins to shape and form us into the kind of people that are no longer just sipping porridge, but are being led in a faith by Christ. See, the whole point of Jesus going to the cross isn't that we needed forgiveness, it's that we needed written into the story. That we're the beloved and we're lost and we're, we're apart from him and now the beloved has on this great adventure to bring us back and he has, he has risen from the dead and he leaves in his train all the captives out of their captivity from the enemy and we're his and the end of the story is insight with our God, with a family life that will never end of love and joy and peace. That's the story. As you look in your heart, know that the Holy Spirit is writing that story in your heart. Amen. We confess the pages that are here as we confess these words. I invite you to please stand.